Good evening. I'm Michael Creasy, Superintendent of the National Parks of Boston. Thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to our community conversation, The Power of Public Monuments in a Time of Racial Reckoning. In 2018, the National Park Service joined the City of Boston and the Friends of the Public Garden and the Museum of African American History to form the Partnership to Renew the Shaw 54th Memorial. This partnership is dedicated to providing the critical restoration work necessary to ensure this monument's longevity for future generations to come. As many of you know, this work is currently underway and it's very exciting to see. And from the onset, we committed ourselves to re-engage the public with the history, meaning, and relevance of the Shaw 54th Memorial. Through our programming, we hope to use the monument as a platform for crucial conversations around race, equity, and social justice today. Tonight's event continues the conversation we began in January 2019 with our program, The Power of Public Monuments and Why They Matter. And this is our first in the 2020-2021 series. This memorial honors the Massachusetts 54th Regiment that was led by Colonel Shaw. The 54th Regiment was one of the first black regiments to serve in the American Civil War. Their service and heroism inspired the enlistment of nearly 200,000 black men in the United States military and helped secure the emancipation of millions. In his remarks at the dedication of the Shaw 54th Memorial, Boston Mayor Josiah Quincy said, may it stand in its place, telling its great and simple story. May the lesson which it teaches sink more deeply into the hearts of our people as years go by. If they ever doubt as to the future of American political institutions, if they ever despair of the Republic, may they here gather new inspiration and courage. Since its unveiling in 1897, this memorial has served as a vibrant space for commemoration, inspiration, and activism. It is a place where the military honors its legacy. It is a place that has inspired great poetry, art, music, and film and it is a place where activists gather today. For more than 120 years, the Shaw 54th Memorial has served as a beacon of hope and as a rallying point for conversations about race, justice, and human rights, issues core to who we are as a people and as a nation. We now find ourselves in a period of great social unrest and uncertainty. Black Lives Matter has reunited public conversations about race, equity, and social justice. A number of public monuments have stirred controversy as people take issue with the context and messages some of these monuments convey. As calls for, calls for the removal of public monuments intensify, what questions should we be asking ourselves? What impacts will today's decisions have on our national memory, identity, and drive to shape a more just and equitable way forward? These are just some of the questions we hope to discuss tonight. And assisting us tonight in facilitating the discussion is our great supporter and friend, Karen Holmes Ward. Karen is WCVB Director of Public Affairs, and she's the Executive Director and host of City Line. In addition, Karen co-produced with the Museum of African American History an award-winning documentary on the 54th called Return to Glory. Karen served as our MC for our first public forum in 2019 and we welcome you back to this virtual stage for tonight's timely conversation. Thank you, Karen, and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael, and good evening, everyone. I am honored to serve as your moderator as we examine the power of public monuments in a time of racial reckoning. The story of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw and the mighty 54th Massachusetts Glory Regiment is familiar to many from the Hollywood dramatization for which Denzel Washington won an Academy Award. The much deeper true story of the regiment and the bronze tribute to them on Boston Common, sculpted by Augustus St. Gaudens, continues to evolve and exemplify the complexities of American history, especially as it pertains to who we call our heroes, and how we commemorate their legacy. The Shaw 54th is the first civic monument to pay homage to the heroism of African-American soldiers and considered the nation's greatest piece of public art. I'm happy to report that its long-needed renewal is officially underway 
All bronze and stone from the plaza level up was removed from Boston Common last week, a solemn moment for all who saw it raised and carried away for conservation off-site. An even more moving moment will come when the memorial returns. Once new waterproofing has been installed under the plaza's brick and a new concrete foundation has been built under the bronze, then the stone that was removed will be replaced and the bronze carefully pinned to the marble structure that surrounds it. Now be sure to check out the 900 feet of interpretive signage installed along the construction fencing, revealing the story of the Civil War, the 54th Regiment, and the creation of the memorial, and the partnership to renew it. Also, visit Shaw54thMemorialRestoration.org for regular updates about the renewal project and upcoming events, including the Fall 2020 Community Conversation on Voting Rights and the Rededication Ceremony planned for 2021. That's Shaw54thMemorialRestoration.org. Now, before you meet our special guests, I want you to know what your role is as audience members. First, we ask that you take a moment to share this on social media. Invite friends to join us for tonight's interactive dialogue on one of two Facebook pages, at Friends of the Public Garden, or live stream on at WCVB page. Both are listed in the chat. Second, please add your voice to the conversation in Zoom. You can post a question or comment in chat or Q&A on Facebook, post as a comment, and please keep your thoughts on topic, public monuments in a time of racial reckoning. And please keep each question or comment under 25 words. We'll thread the audience questions throughout the program and include as many as time allows. And now would be a good time to just remind everyone that we're in a virtual world now. Uh, so if you lose your connection, just log back in, we'll be here. So let's get on with the program. As General Superintendent Creasy said earlier, the memorial has served as a beacon of hope and a rallying point for conversations about race, justice, and human rights. And I'm pleased to introduce two scholars who are here to enrich tonight's dialogue with historical context. Renee Ader and David Blight may already be familiar to you, given how regularly they appear in print and electronic news media about monuments and their place in the American story as well as other topics. Renee Ader is Associate Professor Emerita of American Art at the University of Maryland and visiting professor at Brown University in Providence. She is a scholar of 19th and early 20th century art of the United States, whose research focuses on monuments, race, national identity, and public space. She is the author of Remaking Race and History, the sculpture of Mita Warwick Fuller, as well as other books and numerous articles on public monuments. Currently, she's engaged in a digital project entitled Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past, Race, Memorialization, Public Space, and Civic Engagement. You also may remember Renee for the wonderful insights that she brought to the 2019 Community Conversation on Why Monuments Matter held at Tremont Temple. David Blight is a teacher, scholar, and public historian. He is currently a professor of American history, African American studies, and American studies, and director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. The author or editor of a dozen books, David's most recent work, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, has won several awards, including the Pulitzer Prize in History. His works explore abolition, American historical memory, and African-American history. And his recent New York Times op-ed was on how President Obama's convention speech sought to renew faith in the democratic project. So we wanna begin with a question for our panelists and for all of you who are watching. It's a monument of particular importance here in Boston and recognized as one of 10 monuments that changed America. The Shaw 54th Memorial 
sits opposite the Massachusetts State House at the highest point of the Boston Common. Let's all uh, take a minute to look at this image of the memorial. What message does this monument convey to you? What questions does it invite? What we'd like you to do is enter your responses in the chat. Renee and David, would you share your thoughts on the monument, its meaning, its making, and, and what makes it so significant in the universe of monuments? Renee, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Karen. It's wonderful to be here this evening. I um, wanted to actually start with your two questions you asked the audience about what the message conveys and what questions does it invite. Because I think when we first uh, encounter this uh, monument uh, on Boston Common across from the State House, I always think about the dignity of the men are marching uh, behind the equestrian uh, monument of Shaw so that we see this forward momentum. So dignity, uh, but I also think about the Black emancipatory spirit and that here we have men who are uh, part of the United States, uh, what will become part of the United States colored troops um, engaged in the Civil War on their own behalf. And so that idea of what does it convey is really an, uh, an important uh, point. Uh, so we have the heroic nature of war kind of conveyed through this war monument. Um, and it asks a lot of questions of us. It asks us to think about um, the role of African Americans in the Civil War, and particularly Black men. Um, it asks us, as we're looking at it, to think, what is that figure flying above them? Who is that angel? Or is that an angel? Or is that a figure of death? Or what is it? Um, what are the inscriptions on the monument? Um, and we are seeing here um, as well um, to ask us really interesting questions around race, around the relationship of Shaw to uh, the soldiers of the 54th Regiment. Um, so that's where I wanted to start. And David, if you want to take it off, and then we can come back to kind of meaning and, 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 and how we build meaning um, out of the monument um, as well. Uh, well, thank you, Renee, and thank you, Karen, for those introductions. Uh, I want to pay honor here to the National Park Service and to the entire partnership that uh, pulled off this extraordinary restoration of this monument. Um, I just would like to convey here to our audience, many of whom probably sense this, this monument is unique. Uh, there is no other public sculpture in America like this. Uh, there's a reason many art historians have said this is the greatest work of public art in the United States or ever by an American. And we can come back to who St. Gaudens was, and we should. Um, he got the commission for this in about 1880. I think he started work on this in 1883. He gets the commission about 1884, but he doesn't, this isn't unveiled for 13 years later. That's an amazing story, how this artist created this work, and we will come back to that. But I want the audience to think for a moment, why is this monument different? In a landscape full of thousands of generic Civil War monuments, the vast majority of which are that common soldier, whether it's Confederate or Union, as Robert Lowell said in his great poem about the Shaw Memorial for the Union dead, he said that that lone soldier in the New England town green who leans on his musket and muses through his sideburns. Oh. Well, what does that monument mean to someone? Well, it's a lone soldier musing through his sideburns. But beyond that, you have to make up meaning. This monument tells a story. It tells a narrative. It tells a story about what the war was actually about. It also captures a historical moment. This is late May, uh, 1863, when this regiment that had been trained for months now uh, in Fort Meigs in, in what is now uh, Roxbury um, is brought to the common. They marched up Temple Street, they turned left on Beacon and down Beacon Street they marched. St. Gordon's actually captured in this bronze a historical moment of that regiment marching in front of the state capitol. Uh, there's no other monument I can think of that, that 
it actually captures a historical moment. But above all, it's the story this monument is telling. Who are these men? Why are they marching? Why are their bodies leaning so uh, firmly forward? Where are they going? About one half of them who participated in the battle at Fort Wagner on the sandy beaches around Charleston will be dead, uh, missing, or will die of their wounds. Uh, one half of them in that battle they will fight in July, 1863. This is a monument that says the American Civil War was caused by slavery. It was fought about slavery. Its greatest result was the emancipation of American slaves, which then in turn transformed the United States into something else. There's no other monument also that has ever captured in both, and I know Renee will take us back to this issue, idealism and realism, quite like this monument does. The realism of these faces is still stunning each time I see it, and I've seen it many, many times. Um, but then there's the idealism of this monument, including the angel above, which St. Gaudens went crazy trying to perfect, and he never really did. But it's, it's, a, it's a monument that, that mixes these forms. And last little point, this is a monument about some very old fashioned ideas that we are not comfortable with anymore. We just aren't. Whether it's post 9-11 or post World War II or Vietnam, we're not comfortable with ideas about honor and duty and dying for cause and dying for country. We don't talk easily about that. That's what these men were doing. And we can come back to that as to how they ended up in this regiment and the kind of men that made up this regiment uh, as we go forward with this discussion. David and Renee, I have walked by this monument countless times and each time I do, I get close to the men and look at the expressions on the men's faces, mm -hmm. the flared nostril of the uh, horse, uh, the, 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 the uh, posture, of Robert Gould Shaw in his saddle. Many of the people in our, our chat uh, have asked about how St. Gaudens captured those expressions. And because this is a piece that, you know, is living into perpetuity, how and why he took that extra level of detail. David, do you want to start? I'll let Renee yeah, so I think that's such a, a, a really good observation. So what we're looking at is that um, I believe that St. Gaudens uh, over this 13 year period that took him way too long and him taking many numerous other commissions rather than actually getting this done. He did something like 40, 40 um, plaster uh, renderings of the faces of not, he did not select men of the 54th. He used models in around Boston and that's important to uh, kind of clarify, but that he was interested in portraiture. And as we know, St. Gaudens was a consummate portraiter, uh, portrait artist as well. But so he, he modeled in plaster, sometimes in wax, uh, these individual portraits. But what's really important to kind of keep in mind is that he then amalgamated them. So into kind of almost anonymous portraits. Um, and so he took these, um, these images and in some ways played around with the various models to come up with the 23 heads that we actually see or the 23 bodies that we see uh, in the memorial. Um, and I want to just point out that we're looking, David remarked earlier, but we're looking at something pretty um, remarkable here in the United States as far as monument building, because what St. Gaudens does is to merge kind of three forms. And so we have an equestrian monument, which we're all uh, very familiar with, which we see all over Washington, D.C. and in other cities, men on horses. Uh, we have what's called a bas relief or a, a low to high relief that he carved of the marching soldiers, which is an astounding 
uh, motion that we see in the image that's on the screen now with the rifles pointing backwards and the bodies moving forward. And so you have that kind of tension of people moving. And then we have the allegorical representation on top. So I think it's form, there's no other monument that quite does this, right? That is mm -hmm. able to uh, make these three elements come together. Um, St. Gaudens worked through um, numerous sketches to kind of resolve how he wanted to do this. So originally it was equestrian monument. It was a low relief monument that he started out with and then moving forward. But that notion of who is uh, in the background, it has always uh, been interesting to me that St. Gaudens did not actually tap into um, members of the 54th who were still alive, who attended the opening ceremonies in 1897. Um, the last slide kind of shows us of the men of the 54th in front of the monument. He chose not to do that. And that is uh, very intriguing to me as well. I think St. Gaudens had his own really deep profound issues around race and we shouldn't just erase that in, in the conversation about the memorial either. Um, he really wanted to wholesale focus on our equestrian monument, but it was Shaw's family that made, encouraged him to include um, not only this kind of figuration we see in the relief, but also to include their names on the back of the memorial, right? Which does not happen until 1981, I believe, if I have that date right. So it takes a long time for the names to actually be inscribed. So I see a lot of in the Q&A uh, kind of questions around the idea of um, who are the individuals? Well, we are starting to know that. The uh, National Archives keeps an incredible record of, of lives that you can kind of recover. So, um, but, but, one, but Renee, like, let me ask, uh, why was it significant though that he uh, modeled after individual faces of black men as opposed to just using say one cast for all of the black men? I think it's, it, it kind of symbolizes in a way that even though St. Gaudens had his own issues with race, that it, to him, this kind of demonstrates that black lives mattered in some way because of the individuals that we see in this statue. Well, Karen, I'm not sure I'd go that far, but I do think that what he says, <laughs> I'm not sure I would say that uh, put him on the side of Black Lives Matter, but I would think that St. Gaudens was after is getting at the individuality of these uh, men who are part of the 54th and doing so through a portraiture. Well, and I would add, too, uh, uh, that he is trying to capture different age groups. Uh -huh. uh, um, there is a study of, uh, there's a good social history of uh -huh. the men of the 54th, and it shows the oldest was about 57. There uh -huh. were like a dozen who were only 15 and 16 years old. So he was looking for, for the youthful face, the older face. Look at that drummer boy. How old must uh -huh. he have been? Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And he found these men and boys in train stations in Boston and other places, he recruited them. And many of them, I don't know if they all did, but many of them actually went up to Cornish, New Hampshire, to St. Gordon's studio. Imagine being some 16 year old kid and the guy brings you up to Cornish, New Hampshire on a big old beautiful New England farm and he sculpts your head. You must have wondered. So, so to either of you enlighten us on St. Gordon's view of race or what society was like when the monument was uh, first spoken about? Well, uh, St. Gaudens is one factor. He's a fascinating man. He's, he's actually born in Ireland, uh, emigrates as a child to the United States. And I'm sure Rene knows more about this than I do. He was a prodigy. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was making art as a child. He was doing cameos as a kid. And even uh, when he was very young, he gets uh, art scholarships to go to Paris and Rome. I think he spent five years in Rome modeling all the great sculptors. Mm -hmm. um, we can come back to, and, and originally, just as Rene said, all of his early models for the Shaw were just equestrian. In fact, mm -hmm. the measure of a great public sculptor in the 19th century was, could you do an equestrian? Mm -hmm. That's just the way it was. And that's what he was gonna do until the Shaw family got hold of him and said, no, 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 put the men in. Mm -hmm. And then he changed the whole course of this thing. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons it took so long. So it was Shaw's family that uh, yeah. said these must be individual representations. One of the questions off social media, um, they want to know, weren't there images available to St. Gaudens of the actual soldiers, like uh, the famed uh, Sergeant um, Oh yeah, there were photographs of men of the 54th. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but that might not have, you know, a photograph. He, he did use photographs of Shaw himself, because that's all he had. Shaw was dead. Mm -hmm. um, he, that's, that's why the, the character on the top of that horse looks so much like Robert Gould Shaw. He had mm -hmm. profiles and frontal photographs. I'll just add quickly here, um, uh, Karen, to your question. A lot can be said here. This thing is unveiled in 1897. That's one year after the Plessy v. Ferguson mm -hmm. Supreme Court decision. It is one year after the last black congressman was elected to Congress from North Carolina, the last one that'll serve for the next generation. David, tell us what Plessy v. Ferguson is for those that don't know. Sure. <laughs> it was a separate but equal decision by the Supreme Court with one dissent from Justice Harlan in 1896 uh, that, that said it set the stage for the development of legal segregation in the United States for the next half century and more. But it's also a time now when lynching has become mm -hmm. a profoundly horrible question mm -hmm. all across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 200 to 300 lynchings every year by the middle of the 1890s. Jim Crow laws are being, disfranchisement laws are being passed all across the South. Um, it, in it support of the legal system, with the support yes. of the legal system. It is a terrible time in the history of American race relations. And somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of African Americans and the freed people and their children and grandchildren now are essentially mired in a sharecropping system across mm -hmm. the American South. However, that's again what makes this monument so unique mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. different. This monument is planted there in Boston, you know, abolitionist Boston celebrating itself. That happens a lot. Um, but that monument was planted in a time when American race relations were about as bad as they could ever get. Mm. That's important to remember. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were lynchings. I looked this up once and did some research on it. There were lynchings across the United States the day before the Shaw Memorial was unveiled and the day after, and one of them was in Urbana, <coughs> Ohio. Wow. Is a city that three members of the 54th had originally been recruited from. Interesting, interesting. Renee? Yeah, I see here, um, so someone's asked a really complicated question in the chat about Albert Boehm and his writings on this monument. And I just wanted to get to that question that was way up, but I was uh, by Marty Blatt, I'll just say, but there was a question about Albert Boehm talking about kind of the hierarchy um, and that we have this problem of the elevated white officer and the black troops. I think what we see conveyed here, I mean, it's complicated. He is on a horse, he is elevated. It is the ceremonial parade. His, his sword is pointed downward, right? They are not they're in the process of kind of exiting or leaving Boston that we're seeing and on this horrible, what will become the horrible fate of the 54th um, at Fort Wagner. Um, I think that there, this tension that David just raised for me actually is embedded in the monument around the life in 1897. And the idea of it, even though we see these soldiers who are uh, participating in the US Army, who are uh, going to, to fight in this very, very difficult war, um, the freedoms kind of that one would have assumed promised in the post-Civil War era are not carried out. Like that is hard to not detach from this monument either. Um, mm -hmm. that, that aspirations to freedom are being restricted every single day. And David, your point that there's a lynching before and after only underscore that point, right? Yeah, in fact, th this monument is in some ways uh, all about promise, and betrayal. Yeah. Uh, look at the promise in those guys' faces. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the heroism in their faces. The, they're marching to die, and they mm -hmm. had to die. This is the fact. They had to die to be recognized as human. Yeah, and and chose but, uh, chose death or the potential of certain death. Yeah, uh, because their lives in yeah. the society in which they lived were just painfully, painfully horrible and unfair. Indeed, could I add one little thing? Um, yes, you can. On what Renee addressed there about the officer on the horse and the men behind him. This is an old argument about the Shaw Memorial, as many people out there know, you know, why is Shaw on horseback and the men behind him and so on. 
Well, this may not be the most popular answer to Marty Blatt's question, who was an old friend of mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but St. Gaudens was actually cap capturing exactly what happened. Hmm. Of course Shaw would have been on his horse. The colonel of a regiment, when they marched in parade, always was on a horse. And he would put his, he would draw his sword in a ceremonial way, exactly as St. Gaudens portrayed it. And the men, contrary to the argument I've heard a thousand times, are not subservient. They are doing what soldiers do. Hmm. Soldiers, private soldiers, are subservient to their officer. That's the hmm. army. And in that sense, that is part of the realism of this monument. Hmm. Now, you could just take Shaw out of this, and you know, St. Gaudens could have just done the men. But of course, the commission from the very beginning was called the Shaw. And so they're both there, but that's exactly what you would have seen if you had so, been there that day to watch the, the famous march of that regiment. They're not so it's not they're... just a white guy on horseback and black hmm. guys walking with him. That's how uh, a, a regiment would have performed about to go into battle. They're doing their duty. They're doing they're their soldiers. duty. They're soldiers. And it's, and soldiers it's also do. allegory, right? So I don't want to like erase the allegorical element of this, the idea yeah. of allegory, of the idealized form, right, yeah. of the equestrian monument that we're looking here. Right. Um, so there's this tension between what we want to say is naturalism. We see the horse, the bit pulling back on its, um, right. on its mouth. Um, yeah. So we see that this is there's that naturalism, but we are meant to move beyond, I would actually argue, just the, the physical embodiment of Shaw and the men here to think something right. loftier. What does it mean to march to war? What does it mean to be one of these regiments that is going off surely to death? Yeah. Um, what does it mean that they are massacred, really, at Fort Wagner, a completely uh, illogical battle? In my mind, I am not a battle historian, but every time I read about Fort Wagner, I think, what were people thinking to actually command that they rush up into that, up the hill and to only be shot down? Um, and the fact that Shaw, what? It was a suicidal attack. Suicide right. mission. So suicide have, mission. Um, and perhaps this suicide mission, it's hard to divorce this monument now from the movie Glory. I think lots of us have seen that movie, so it's hard sometimes to divorce it from that. Right. Um, but that allegorical representation of the woman with the poppies and the floating above them, but the solemnity of all of the men marching off to sure death is really uh, quite powerful. Uh, that moves beyond this idea of it um, being, I've seen it argued as a history painting or a history painting in bronze. Yeah. Um, that we're, we have that tension uh, between kind of idealism that David mentioned at the very beginning and the realism uh, conveyed through like the accuracy of the Springfield rifle of the U.S. Army buckle, uh, the, yep. the eagle uh, 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 button that was really important for black soldiers to wear these elements of mm -hmm. the Union uniform. It showed that they were dedicated to the Union and Absolutely. with the aspiration for citizenship, right? So if we look in this uh, image, you can see that there's this incredible detail uh, that uh, St. Gaudens is also uh, included in the memorial to bring us back to this, his this really historical moment, right? In fact, yeah, keep that someone... image up. Keep that image up for a moment because mm -hmm. I had the great privilege once to hear uh, Vincent Scully give a lecture on this monument. It was actually up at Cornish, the St. Gaudens National Park site. And it was the new casting, that gold casting that they then moved down to the National Gallery in Washington. But in that speech, and I actually have a copy of it, he said, the men are moving Shaw as much as Shaw is moving the men mm -hmm. in the monument. And that image shows you that. Those men are the, are the movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shaw is standing straight like, you know, like he's just Mr. Duty. The men are oh. moving forward and they are moving that. And can, can anybody name another monument you've ever seen in the world where it almost feels like it truly is moving? Mm -hmm. How do you make bronze move? Someone commented in the chat that uh, Robert Gould Shaw seems stiff and immovable. Yeah. And to your point, David, the men uh, on foot are leaning forward. There's motion in their movement. Oh, yeah. You can see the motion in their... They're graceful. The graceful. You can see the wind in the fabric of their slacks. You can see the movement just coming yeah. off of the monument. Someone also in chat wanted to uh, 
make note that uh, Shaw was buried with the men That's of right. his regiment. Mm -hmm. In the beach, in the sand, mm -hmm. thrown into a pit uh, with his men. And, and his, father, his father was told they would try to go retrieve the body for him. He said, no, leave him with his men. So that's an interesting kind of societal thing too, that Shaw was buried with black soldiers. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind that piece of it? Well, after the battle, uh, the, the, the dead were simply put into a mass grave by the Confederates, mm -hmm. uh, be, right in front of Battery Wagner. They just made a mass grave. Mm -hmm. And by the way, where that where that fort or battery was then is now under the sea. Uh, the, the, the ocean has claimed the beaches on Morris Island. Uh, so there's nothing left there today. The bones of Shaw and his men are in the sea, if you like, uh, which is another uh, kind of metaphor or irony here, if you want. Uh, uh, bones to bones from the slave trade to Fort Wagner, if you want. Uh, but, but, you know, I don't know that they could have retrieved Shaw's body, mm -hmm. but there was talk about doing it, bringing mm -hmm. him back to Boston for proper burial and all of that. And his family just said, no, leave him there. Mm -hmm. uh, and as the, as the family insisted that they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I think that gets to another question that someone on the Q and uh, on the chat asked about the Shaw's family's a commitment to having the 54th also represented on the monument. That's really driven by the family and by their own politics, right, uh, as abolitionists. And I think that's important to a state here um, as well. I wanted to come back to, uh, to one thing that, so because someone's asked actually, I'm, I'm actually looking at the chat while we're doing this as well, but someone left something right, in the are. chat about uh, <laughs> who is that floating figure above and oh. um, can we provide, there is not a close up, I guess, we don't have a really good close up of it, but it's an allegorical representation. So I think that's something that you, which is very common in Beaux-Arts sculpture in late 19th century, early 20th century, the, the female body as allegory shows up over and over again. We see it in the Sherman Monument that is in Central Park, where there's this kind of a woman who looks a little bit like this floating figure, you know, leading him forward on the march. Um, Which is also a St. Gardens, by the way. Right. <laughs> And so we see this figure who holds a olive branch, which we can symbolically read as peace, and then the poppies of death. And so we have that figure, and then we have the pine cones that suggest the southern landscape. I also think that's something that's, he's left all these clues uh, for us to kind of, and I want to, to read it, to visually read the monument. Um, and then we have that quote, which is the motto of the Society of the Cincinnati. So there's, in reference to a uh, Shaw who was a member of the Society of the C Cincinnati. So he forsook all to preserve the public wheel. So that figure up there, it's, it's a favorite of St. Gaudens. I mean, some form of it that gets adapted over time, uh, just to answer the question from the Q&A. Someone in um, chat wanted to know if this uh, represented Lady Liberty or represented Liberty, but, but no. 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 I, I would be really careful of making that association to Lady Lady, Lady Liberty. That's not something that... Um, or, or just Liberty. No, no. really this, uh, with the poppies gives us a very different idea of what that figure is doing, right? This uh, mm -hmm. almost, some people argue perhaps a symbolic figure of death or a figure who is, you know, peace and death combined. Yes, David. Oh, no, just, uh, no, that was great. It's just that... <laughs> She's an angel doing what I guess angels are supposed to do, which is to mediate between us and death or between the ideal and the real and, you know, to be this mediator of some kind. Mm. And, and he, he does, he put in, what, an olive branch instead of a... Yeah, olive and poppies. Yeah. Someone yeah. on chat also mentioned that there's a pine cone at the top of the Massachusetts State House. Mm. Hey. So there's a nice combination uh, connection to there. So let's that actually allows me to segue here to the placement on 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 the common, which I think is incredibly important for this memorial. Um, I know that there's been a lot of debates in Boston that it seems that it is on the edge, that it is not figured prominently enough on Boston Common. Uh, for me, this monument is such an intervention in that space because it's right across from the state house, right. um, and to have these kind of 
the see this this movement of black soldiers moving in front of the state house, both in parade dress as they went to war, but also during the ceremonies when this was dedicated, is yeah. quite a powerful historic image to think of men being very much activated and engaged in that space, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that Boston Common has a complicated, a very long and complicated history. Um, I'm not a Bostonian, so I don't want to totally dive into that, but I do think it's a complicated space. Um, and it's also interesting to me that this is on an angle, if one were to move at a diagonal, to the Crispus Attucks uh, Memorial that is also on Boston Common, to the first uh, black, uh, first person to die, you know, during the Revolutionary War. So there's this dialogue that's happening with this monument, not just that it sits there, uh, but with Boston Common as a space. It had, as a dialogue that happened in the late 19th century and all the way to our present moment in the 21st. It's, just, it's how monuments operate. They live in these public spaces and we must engage them um, and, and, and interact with them. I mentioned Black Lives Matter of a few minutes back um, and let's kind of um, bring it forward today. In the context of Black Lives Matter, uh, this monument has raised um, questions for people. Um, how might we animate monuments like the Shaw 54th to create space for learning and, and dialogue in this, in this time of racial reckoning? We well, see so many monuments being pulled down in the South, uh, you know. Yeah. Expound on that, please. Well, we, could be, we have to begin by simply saying this one should never be taken down ever. <laughs> uh -huh. There's nothing else like it. And anybody who really wants to take this one down, I'm forming a committee and you got to come and talk to us. Uh, but anyway, uh, we can start by moving the bus stop. Seriously. Uh -huh. I've taken many groups of teachers and groups of people there and I stand up on the monument and I try to give my 20 minute lecture on the Shaw Memorial and I have to stop every three minutes because of the sound of the buses. I it may not be possible for traffic, but please move the bus stop from, from in front of this, ma this magnificent piece of art. Um, and then I think the National Park Service has for years been doing their best to interpret the Civil War through this monument, mm -hmm. but it has to be done with these, these quick talks done by rangers and so on out at, at the monument. I applaud them for what they've apparently done on the fences around the site now. I, I can't wait to go up to Boston and see all of that. But the, the answer in, in the end, uh, Karen, is we simply have to do more history about this. I hate mm -hmm. to say that as a historian, but the monument itself has such an amazing history. And then there's the history it represents. That's what's so beautiful about it in a way. You can do two profound things with this monument. One is about art, public art. And the other is about the meaning of the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, if which forever we can continue to teach, uh, whether there's a movie made about it or not. And I think that I, um, I actually, this is a monument that I have a, that I visit every time I come to Boston without fail. It's just part yeah. of my circuit of coming. To, I visit mm -hmm. that and then I go over and look at the Meadow Work Fuller Monument over uh, in the South End. Um, that's about emancipation. Two fundamentally different kinds of monuments, but they're right. monuments I visit every time I go to Boston. I think some monuments should come down. That's, I'm, I'm very firm about that. I've written about this. I've talked about it. I think that we have no space for Confederate monuments in the United States. They are a false narrative. Um, they are telling us a story about the Civil War that is, as I call, I actually called it the original fake news story, right, mm -hmm. of this lost cause. Um, but we have a problem with that because it is allowed, um, particularly, and we see this retributive, the symbolic violence towards monuments is intense um, because they seem to represent set in stone, set in bronze in our public spaces. What some of us are really uh, thinking are false narratives, uh, that they are representations that do not fully um, uh, tell the story of American history. I think the St. Gaudens Memorial, for me personally, is in a very different kind of category. Um, I have argued for the removal of the Thomas Ball Monument in DC, um, because I think it's a racist image. And I think that, that it's- Thomas Ball Monument, that's the one with Abraham Lincoln. Yes, you have the second the, cast in Boston. And we, yes, right uh, behind the Four Seasons, in between the Four Seasons and Legal Seafoods. Yes. Yes. Horrible I think, location. Horrible. I think the city of Boston has decided to yeah, take that have. one down. 
They have. Whereas in D.C., we're in a big debate, and the president has, you know, put up a protection around it. But I do think that there's certain monuments that are no longer effective. And I would actually argue that over time, the federal government has removed monuments from public spaces. And the most famous is probably the George Washington, because it's a horrible image of George in a toga by Horatio Greenow, right? So it is housed in the National Museum of American History. But they did remove a really very painful image. And if I can make this work, I'll just stick it in the background of my uh, thing so you can see it since I didn't send it to anybody, but I'll stick it in as a filter. Um, this rescue, if you can, if I move my head a little yeah. bit out of the way, yeah, yeah. is a super problematic sculpture that Horatio Greenow, you know, unfortunately didn't get some things right <laughs> um, in, in doing sculpture. Um, but the rescue is one that they took down in the 50s. And they said, this is completely inappropriate image to be on the Capitol, on the East Lawn, on the East uh, staircases of the Capitol. So we have removed monuments. Um, we have uh, particularly relocated them to museums in the past. Um, I would also just say, just to put this out there, that his, historically, as an art historian, iconoclasm has existed, probably existed as long as human beings have been creating memorial art or creating monuments, right? That we, mm -hmm. Think about what happened in Egypt with the destruction of monuments or during Roman times. Like this is not new, this interaction where we want to, right. um, when we are feeling intensely, um, and George Floyd made us feel intensely angry, particularly mm -hmm. the people who were uh, uh, engaging with monuments and either tearing them down or... Um, well, um, well, Renee, well, who, decides, who decides whether a monument stays or goes? Um, and from your perspectives, what's a useful set of criteria for that decision making? I think it has to be a community con uh, conversation. And I point to two very recent episodes that are very easy for us to actually use as models. Um, one is the controversy that just happened in October of 2019 in New York City between the selection of the Simone Lee uh, versus the Vinnie Bagwell uh, sculpture. And the animosity, like I watched that video of the Percent for Art meeting was stunning. You cannot mm -hmm. invite the community to participate and then ignore their voices. Right. That's like a mm -hmm. fundamental to me, like no, no. Yeah. Um, the other is actually a really complicated uh, monument that was proposed by Fred Wilson for Indianapolis in 2011 that fostered tremendous outroar. And uh, for me, the most uh, core thing that I think about as we move forward, with, if we're gonna keep building monuments, and that's something we should be thinking very, very hard about, but if we're gonna keep moving forward, communities, and I mean this as broad as possible, must be engaged in this dialogue. You do not plot monuments in people's neighborhoods and say, live with it. You ask people to actually be involved, to create surveys. Philadelphia, the um, Monument Lab in Philadelphia has done an excellent job of asking Philadelphians, how might you re-visualize public space? These are very important questions. So, um, you know, no more all curatorial panels or all city official panels when deciding about monuments. These have to be yeah. very broad and far ranging. Uh, Susan Wilson that? notes in the chat that the removal of the Dr. Sims statue in New York City is another example of a monument that was removed. He was the father of gynecology who mm -hmm. experimented on enslaved females without anesthesia. David, let me ask you, um, who do you think should decide whether a monument stays or goes? And, and what do you think are useful mm -hmm. criteria for decision making? Well, I'm pretty much right where Renee is. I think it should be, first of all, local, except for certain national monuments. And inside the US Capitol is a national mm -hmm. affair. There mm -hmm. are 12, or is it 13, monuments of confederates inside in, the u.s capitol right. and in, in statuary hall statuary hall and that is yep. because every state gets two there's mm -hmm. a reason for that but jefferson davis and robert e lee in the u.s capitol is unacceptable uh that that but that's an but but almost all monuments have to be local in their decisions communities have to decide a city has to decide secondly it has to be deliberative it has to be deliberative, as messy as it can be. And it, it, you know, the more democracy you have, the messier it gets. But you got to be deliberative. And thirdly, again, my training comes through here. There should always be some attempt to learn, learn some history when mm -hmm. we go through this process. 
just tearing something down willy nilly because I've always hated that is not an answer. Mm -hmm. I would say too, that I am for taking down most Confederate monuments as well, especially those in, in, in public civic spaces. I am not for taking them down in cemeteries. I'm, I'm... I just, you know, cemeteries are cemeteries. And a monument in a cemetery. Emily has a, Ivan in chat reminds us that the Shaw Family Monument at Mount Auburn Cemetery was built by Robert Gould Shaw's grandfather over the family vault, and a small plaque was added later for Robert Gould Shaw in Mount Auburn. Yeah. Mount Auburn, yeah, which is mm -hmm. one of the great, uh, you know, memorial cemeteries in the United States. Uh, but anyway, one last thing. I, I disagree about the Freedmen's Memorial. I know you do. <laughs> Renee, and I've been on record with this, wrote it in Washington Post, et cetera, yeah. uh, largely because of how it was created, mm -hmm. who created it. It was created by African Americans. Tell uh, us the story of how it was created and how the, the money was yeah. collected to build it originally. The nearly $20,000 was collected by African Americans. The first $5 was given by a woman named Charlotte Scott, the former slave from Missouri. Uh, the committee that created this, the committee that, that oversaw the whole unveiling ceremony was a black committee. It was a parade, through, it was a classic African-American parade through Washington, D.C. on the day of the unveiling. Master of Ceremonies was black. Bishop of the Amy Church was black, of course. And Frederick Douglass gave the mm -hmm. second greatest speech of his life at the unveiling of that. And we now know from some intrepid research, not done by me, but by a couple friends of mine, yeah. that Douglas, only five days after that unveiling, said in the, the uh, National Republican newspaper in Washington that, you know, I'm not that fond of that kneeling slave, and they really mm -hmm. should build a second monument next to it about mm -hmm. the broader story of emancipation. So mm -hmm. I like Douglas's alternative. I think we do need now a serious, serious discussion of how to commemorate emancipation in this country. Hmm. Let's let a, a thousand flowers bloom. Let's bring in some young artists. Let them go abstract. Let them go as modern as they want. Let's create m the commemoration of emancipation where we have previously spent 150 years commemorating only the war. And yes, that'll get really democratic and messy too, but think what amazing stuff could come out of this. Oh, uh, David, let me quickly insert this question that came over chat um, to you. When is the movie on Profit or Freedom coming out? And uh, how can you explain the absence of a biopic on Frederick Douglass? I can't explain the absence. I've been involved with different groups, different screenwriters, different production companies for over 20 years to try to get a Douglass film made. It's the movie business, folks. It's a crazy business. But there's a movie in the works. Screenwriter's been hired. It's being done by Higher Ground, which is the Obama's film company. But don't hold your breath. These things take okay. a Okay, they take a long time. So uh, tied to my last, the uh, last question that I posed, um, but thinking about the full collection of public monuments across the country, and David, you kind of began to address this, uh, talking about the um, monuments in Statuary Hall, but how might a reimagined national memorial landscape address issues of equity, justice, and national identity. How do we get there? Well, I wrote a piece in the New York Times just recently, which got nowhere. <laughs> and I recommended that the Biden campaign uh, announce a, a commission, a task force, uh, whatever they want to call it. And not just with curators and historians, Renee, but with community people, with people who care about these things, know about these things a real national commission not to determine what to build in Texas or what to build in you know, Massachusetts, but to begin to find best practices, to mm. recruit young artists, to actually provide some resources for this. Why not? Like the 1930s. I why not a w like WPA. Yeah, why not a WPA <laughs> style art project that says, you know what? We got a big history in this country, a big complicated, multi-ethnic history, how, we, how should we think about in the 21st century commemorating this as the Confederate memorial landscape may indeed be coming down? What do we replace it with? And do we always replace it with monuments? Maybe, maybe we need to memorialize in other ways. Maybe we should commission a symphony. Maybe we should, you know, 
let, let's have money. If we're going to have monuments, let's have monuments to ideas and not just to people. We always get into trouble when we put the mm -hmm. name of somebody on it because somebody does some research and finds out they're not perfect. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, I think there needs, we need a pause, actually. We need uh -huh. a pause to, and, and David, I think we need criteria. We yeah, yeah. need a checklist. We need to be talking really hard. I'm not sure that monuments ever answer any of these really difficult questions around race and nation and identity. I, for one, I'm working through this project for the last decade. I more and more think that we need to actually have a moratorium on monument building. And we ask to monuments have, to do too much, don't we? Yeah, that we have some really uh, deep conversations about memorialization and what that means. I think, honestly, and I mentioned this last year when I participated in the community conversation, we need a fundamental rewriting of our history textbooks. How about that for high school mm -hmm. and grammar kids, right? Mm -hmm. Age kids. Let's start there. Let's start there. <laughs> Let's start there. Actually, let's start with rewriting a history that is inclusive, which most kids are not getting that history about the Civil War or mm -hmm. um, slavery. I've been astounded at the number of undergraduates who've said to me, I knew nothing about any of this. I'm like, how could that possibly be true? Yeah. Um, but kind of miseducation of our American children, that to me is really important. Um, I am still a big fan of James Young's work on counter monuments and think that we could do some really interesting mm -hmm. pushback about things that already exist there. I did want to say um, I'm impressed with the signage that is now educating the Boston public about the, the, the Robert Goldshaw and 54th uh, Memorial. I think that's important. But I do, I also have been thinking that we need more green spaces. We need more spaces where people feel that they can collect and talk to each other. We don't have a lot of those kind of reflective spaces in the United States. This may support some of what you're saying, Renee, and I go back to the ball monument um, that uh, it was in Washington and of course the uh, copy that's in, in, in Boston. When they erected that monument, they thought it was appropriate and socially acceptable. So, uh, well, Thomas know, Ball did. <laughs> Thomas Ball. So decades later, yeah. you know, we look at history in a different way. So to your point, uh, do the monuments that we erect today, is there that chance, that possibility that well, decades from now, people may better. say, yeah, people may say, well, gee, uh, why is this here? Well, the problem is, and, and again, we don't always like to hear this, we can't purify the past. Mm. The past is a foreign country. It was mm. different. You know, mm -hmm. a sculptor had to do an equestrian, and no one would do an equestrian today. Can you imagine mm -hmm. some sculpture? Sculptor turns in a, a design. Well, Kehinde Wiley did do an equestrian monument well, that's, that's true. Richard, that's true. That's right. <laughs> an alternative equestrian. Yeah, and I equestrian like Equestrian monument. That's it's right. In, it's in uh, Charlottesville now, isn't it? I think. Uh, no, in Richmond, uh, outside Richmond, the right. uh, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. That's right. That's, that's the one that models right. Jeb Stewart, but it's like a Black Lives Matter activist on the horse. Yeah, <laughs> I like that kind of thing. But, you know, uh, let's let a, a thousand flowers bloom. I actually agree with you that maybe what you know, if I, if I ever got this commission created, which we never will, but, you know, one of the things it could do is look at this whole idea of memorialization and do comparison. What have they done around the world with mm -hmm. this? What have the Germans done? Yes, it's sure. fascinating stuff Germans uh, and, uh, and others have done with, with Holocaust memorials. Uh, what, what have they done in other cu countries with this problem? How have mm -hmm. other cultures dealt with their most conflicted and divisive parts of their past. I think what we could learn from that, that's, and that's not just academic. I mean, the public loves that kind of knowledge. If you, and, other, and the other thing is, let's not forget museums. I mean, museums mm -hmm. have undergone a revolution in the last 20 mm -hmm. years. In Returning the, all the things that they borrowed from other countries? Well, there's that, yes. There's that <laughs> with art museums, but also the techniques, the methods and so on that museums, because of all the technology now, there have been some extraordinary exhibits the last decade, decade and a half about slavery, mm -hmm. about lynching, about, about mm -hmm. the hardest parts of our past. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but they're always temporary. Mm -hmm. They're almost always temporary. They're, they're, well, an exhibition think, goes up and goes down. You know, it's, uh, you know, but I think, you know, one of the monuments that I think uh, today is 
for me personally, as someone who's been working on, on monuments and kind of public space, is really the National Memorial for Peace and Justice uh, that the mm -hmm. Equal Justice Initiative uh, created in Montgomery, Alabama. And that memorial is probably the most profound experience I've ever had in a memorial space because it really Every day? For yeah. those people that don't know about Equal Justice Initiative and Brian Stevenson, so, so, so the Equal Justice Initiative is really their goal is to fight for um, uh, fight against mass incarceration and the, and the long term kind of lack of access of brown and black people to equitable uh, legal services um, and people who, particularly who are on death row and helping people who may be on death row illegally to get off it. So that's kind of what Eagle Justice Initiative, they spent a lot of time doing this. They developed both a museum in Montgomery, Alabama. But, but very, very, very quickly describe what that monument, what that looks the like. Memorial is, so memorial it looks, takes yes. a, ti a title that I am intrigued by because it tells you nothing about what the memorial is about, which is interesting to me. It is a monument to lynching. Mm -hmm. And they are corteen uh, steel boxes. And corteen is a rust, uh, a rusted treated uh, uh, metal. And boxes with, from every state and county uh, quite frankly, I think in the U.S. they have one from every every state except for maybe Alaska, um, and they have the names of black men and women who have been lynched in the United States. And this has a, been a long term work of the Equal Justice Initiative to start this um, anti lynching memorial. And they also did things like collect soil samples, uh, soil from a variety of lynching sites, which is also powerful. Um, so that memorial effectively is considered a sacred site and you enter it and it is quiet and you walk through it and you are devastated by sheer, looking at violence as it was enacted against the black body. I mean, in the United mm -hmm. States, there's no way you can avoid that experience. Um, so I do think- model, It's more on the model of a, of a Holocaust. The, yes, uh, it is. Yes, the Holocaust it, Museum. And yeah. more in line with something like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial by Maya Lin, who did that remarkable black V in the ground with the list of everyone who died uh, in, in the war. So I do think that there's the potential to create really powerful memorials. I would say one thing that um, I found power, you know, about that Montgomery, Alabama memorial is that it is trying to wrestle with a really difficult topic that we do not want to talk about in the United States. And that mm -hmm. is the legacy of lynching yeah. and its direct tie to incarceration. And so that is a really profound uh, monument. I also think, you know, someone asked a question that I do want to go back to in the chat um, that was, how do we deal with changing communities as they relate to monuments? And this gets to the core of our problem, you know, about the changing communities and how we deal with our public spaces and who has access to the public space. So if you are an African American living in Boston and you have felt excluded from Boston Common, then you're going to really want to question why the St. Godin's Monument gets to stay up, or you're going to want to do an intervention uh, in that space. Um, but you know, and I come back to the Thomas Ball because I live in DC, I have driven around that monument uh, every Wednesday for a decade because my mother-in-law attended church on that, on the park where the Thomas Ball uh, monument is located. I asked a question, what does it mean to see a crouching slave to a five-year-old? How do we explain over and over again to children who enter that park because there's two playgrounds, what that monument means? I don't mm -hmm. think you can do it actually. Mm -hmm with mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. um, and then what is it what they take away uh, from seeing that kneeling figure of a black man day in and day out as they visit that park, oftentimes with their nannies, right? So it raises, there's all sorts of really interesting race issues that play out in Lincoln Park in DC that are also now part of that memorial. And David, listen, the fact that it is the first monument commissioned by African Americans is super important. Thomas Ball did not care that it was commissioned by African Americans. He did not hear their voices. They did not go to his studio in, in, in Italy to look at that final image that's based but on really old <laughs> images of slave, the enslaved body, right? That goes back to the Roman times. So, um, so I think that changing communities are really important to think about how we're gonna interact with these memorials and how we create them. And Karen, your point is, you could build a new monument on Boston Common right now, and I will guarantee you in 20 years, there'll be someone wondering why it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I wanna go back and uh, pick up some of the questions that were, that were in the chat. Uh, were the Confederates insulting Shaw by burying him with his black soldiers? Were they insulting Shaw by doing that? Uh, yeah, no doubt. 
Yeah. No doubt. They strip them of their uniforms too, like the strip uniforms. The uniform, come off or, yeah. Yeah. As an officer, technically, I mean, by the rules of war, he should have been allowed a proper burial and so forth and so. No, they, they stripped his uniform and buried him with his men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also this one comment, if I could, I think that talks about mon monuments are political statements. Without a doubt, we see it there in every major city in America has a kind of monument culture that is meant to send its citizens very typical, very specific yeah. kind of monuments, whether uh, messages, whether it be about national identity or civic identity or yeah. about race or even about gender, because someone asked this question about gender. Women aren't figured, obviously, uh, except for this allegorical figure, but this is a a really important uh, statement um, from Ronald Sa Sa Saunders about these uh, political statements that monuments, they're ideological, right? We can never escape that, that they are ideological. In fact, there may be no more ideological monument than the Shah, when yeah. you think about it. Uh, also, I mean, think about it. We're now getting monuments to women's suffrage. You know, the, the Susan Anthony, Katie Stanton, Sojourner Truth monument in New York City. And, and many others are beginning to happen. But just give that 25 or 50 years. And, you know, people are gonna look closely at Elizabeth Cady Stanton's racism, and who knows what'll happen to them. But that's okay. I mean, this is the history of monuments, but it's one yeah. that we need to rethink, what does a monument do? And we constantly are caught up in, the, you know, if we don't like that name, this person, this Confederate must come down, this imperialist must come down, this conquistador must come down, and we have to find an alternative person to put in the place. Mm -hmm. That's not always the best answer. Mm -hmm. uh, James notes, James in the chat notes that he's already seen people criticizing Susan B. Anthony for racism. Um, of course, well, you know, it's there. You don't have to look that hard. Yeah, but. anyone who's following <laughs> the hundredth uh, anniversary of the of the suffragette movement, et cetera, I think either. Stanton, uh, um, Anthony, or Susan, B., one of them, uh, argued to have the have white women vote before black men. I mean, that's oh, yeah. pretty standard now. Pretty, yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, the and the Dutch monument in, 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 uh, the monument to the suffragettes in New York was not without his own controversy because oh, the original yeah. design only had two white suffragettes, as if black women oh. were not part of the suffrage movement, right? So, right, that so monument's so already had it an intervention before it's released. Um, I, can I make a comment to, um, Megan Woods raised a really, because I'm running a memorial right now, but Megan Woods has a really interesting question about access at, in time when people may have limited access to public spaces and monuments, how can we utilize digital spaces? And I have seen some really terrific uh, digital memorials and I do think that we can do that. They are uh, both have a strange tension between being both permanent and ephemeral, uh, right? So we create them and then they will live forever in some algorithm somewhere on the net. But they're also ephemeral and they can be let go. And I really intrigued about how we can use digital space more often uh, for memorialization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what else we have in the chat. Roxanne wants to know, are any of the current 54th Regiment reenactor members uh, in the audience? And I think uh, we have a very robust um, 54th Regiment Reenactor Organization here in uh, Boston, and they... I bet um, there's some from New Bedford, too. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. Uh, Sarah Gray comments um, that she agrees we should prioritize rewriting our history books. How can we inclusively memorialize our history if our community cannot easily access its own history? Mm. And Joseph Okafor, he yes. is in this uh, Zoom conversation, he says, I am one member of the 54th from Hyde Park, Boston. Hello, Joseph. Thank you for being here with us this evening. So what Can about I that? On uh, the textbooks? Can I comment on the textbooks? Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, we have to find something to a little bit disagree about once in a while. Yeah, sure. We don't often <laughs> require. You know, this is one of the ironies of this. Change is never enough. But there have been profound changes in textbooks in the last 20 years, 30 years. I'm a co-author on, granted it's a college textbook, but I've been a co-author on a textbook for way over 20 years. And our textbook is as, is, is, I don't know, up-to-date, multi-ethnic, multicultural uh, as you're ever going to find by, by some, if I do say so, some, six of us write it, or some very good historians. 
And at the high school level, there's been tremendous work done for high school textbooks. The problem is the <laughs> politics of how they're adopted. Yeah. In Texas is one committee that picks the textbooks for the whole state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And that, that happens in other states as well. And sometimes it's for given school districts. There's this one committee of three people who don't know any history get to adopt the books. Yeah. So I just, I guess I'm saying historians have really changed textbooks in recent yeah. years. But it Carl doesn't really get in the hands of all the kids. Carl Cruz um, says, yes, we are here from New Bedford. Yes. Carl, how are you, man? <laughs> And I wanted to point out again, because there's been several in the chat, these questions about how to find out more biographical information. And so I put a link to the uh, to the National Archives, which has a whole section on um, the historic black troops on um, black soldiers in the Civil War. But more than that, it, there's the ability to look up uh, individual soldiers to see if you can find family members. And that's really important And that there's a monument here in DC um, the African-American Civil War Memorial with a museum attached to it where you can actually do the research right in the museum on the day you visit. So this information is- In the is Robert Gould Shaw neighborhood, right? In the Robert Gould Shaw neighborhood, that's right. But this information is out there to find who these individual men uh, were during, uh, who were United States troops. And there's lots of really excellent documentation, right, on these soldiers um, and really good books that you can get quite easily from the public library around this topic as well. I just noticed that there were several in the chat questions about how do we find out biographical information. Sure. There's actually a brilliant essay on the 54th, for those who don't know it, by a, a historian now deceased named Ed Redke. Mm -hmm. He did this deep social history of the members of the 54th. It's a well-documented regiment. Oh. There are 107 members. They came from all of the states. It was a national regiment. The, the, by far, the state that had the most was from Pennsylvania. Mm. There were five Confederate states represented. Men had been born there. There were some from Bermuda and the Caribbean. I mean, this, this was a, a broad national regiment. It's an amazing you know, uh, composite of American black men who were in this Massachusetts regiment. It's a, mm -hmm. and we have their names. Mm -hmm. Maureen uh, commented that because uh, Texas and California are such large states, yeah. they have an unusually powerful uh, position in terms of purchasing and how textbooks should be. They do indeed. Written. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Texas someone, wanted to, someone wanted to go back to uh, talk about the difference between monuments and memorials. Mm. Okay. So sure. I actually think for me, you know, a memorial, I actually see these, a monument can be a memorial. Um, so, a, and a memorial is a memorial. So a memorial tends to be dedicated either to one individual or two kind of in memory of that person. So it could be in memory, uh, whether the memorials um, to Shaw here who died in battle, but it tends to memorialize. I think a monument is, um, has all of these political and national and um, kind of civic functions that sometimes memorials don't have quite the same, um, um, quite the same meaning in that way. So the Shaw Memorial for me is a memorial and a monument combined. I actually see these things as functioning too differently in different ways. And I would just like to point out particularly memorialization for me now, I've become obsessed with cemeteries and the way in which particularly around free uh, former enslaved uh, folks and uh, freed persons in the early 19th century about how that memorialization effort is often undermined or lost within that context. So I do think um, um, that that idea that there, they can be two different things. So the Washington Monument in DC is a monument, right? There is, I don't really consider there kind of a, a memorialization effort. That is a a nation state statement that happens in the middle of the Smithsonian Mall, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Vietnam, it's called the Vietnam a, Veterans Memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, done at a time when all the veterans were alive. Uh, and of course, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I think they blend into one another. I think they do. They, they really do. Although a statue of one person put on the town lawn down there is a monument, usually. Uh, and sometimes they're just generic with no politics. That's an interesting question too, and Renee, you brought that up nicely. 
you know, it's worth everybody thinking for a moment in all in your life of around Boston or any other city you live in, what monuments have had meaning for you and what monuments haven't? What, what, mon is it, what monument has ever made you weep mm -hmm. or cry? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you learn its story, that's why the Shaw, until you know the story of the Shaw, it's just this beautiful work of bronze. But, but when you learn the history of the story mm -hmm. of that regiment, my God, you know, it, yeah. it, it moves you. But many monuments don't move us at all. We go by them every day of our lives. We don't, we don't give a damn about them. And they get abandoned uh, until there's a politics of some kind that brings them back. And that's what we're living through right now. Mm -hmm. Since the massacre in Charleston, every Confederate monument in this country has to some degree been suspect to some, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no matter how generic, no matter how, how it's tucked away in some corner of a small town, they're all, most of them are still up, by the way. There's a lot of Confederate yeah. monuments. And, and many of those Confederate monuments were put up 50 years after the Civil War. They were intended to intimidate. Oh, yeah. Correct? No question. Yeah. 30, 40, and 50 years after. Yeah. Uh -huh. No question. And we have uh -huh. unveiling speeches for many of them, especially the somewhat larger ones. Mm -hmm. uh, that make that very clear. They were put up by the Ladies Memorial Associations, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, and the United Confederate Veterans. They controlled mm -hmm. that process, and mm -hmm. they were telling a story about the lost cause. And by the way, the other major context here for the Shaw Mem Memorial is it is put there in Boston on the common in 1897, just as the lost cause tradition right. and argument has really set in across American culture. And it's mm -hmm. even setting in across the North. The lost cause is becoming a kind of triumphant narrative that is even a national narrative. And it's not about loss anymore. It was about the victory over reconstruction. This monument says well, you may be inventing this lost cause and you may think you had the victory over Reconstruction, but we won the war. Mm -hmm. Liz notes in the chat that there has been consideration about changing the name of this memorial to the 54th Regiment Memorial and assume that Colonel Shaw is the leader of the regiment. Um, what are your thoughts about changing it to 54th Regiment Memorial? Haven't a lot of people sort of done that in an informal way already, the Shaw 54th, you know, that's, I mean, for years and years, I've heard people refer to it both ways. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, if you took Shaw's name off it, then you, you are in effect erasing the history of how it came about. You know, the commission of 20 some Bostonians who went out and found St. God's and commissioned him to do this, were commissioning a Shaw Memorial. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Put the two names together, why not? They're even thinking of calling Washington, D.C. Douglas Washington, mm -hmm. if it ever becomes a state, so why not? Yeah. How, about, how about Banneker City, since he laid it out? <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, and I think, you know, Banneker, D.C. I think Tolls, I think, originally asked this question, and so I want us to go back to it. I do think that uh, it's important to include the 54th as part of the title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It allows people to kind of understand what they're seeing um, and it foregrounds their contribution to the war effort. And I think that's really important that we get their name out there uh, in front. Um, and so I, I actually appreciate that question. I actually appreciate that more and more. I never just call it the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial, never. I don't mm -hmm. call it that in my classes. I don't tell people. I don't, and in fact, I tend to refer to it as the 54th. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just how I think of it um, mm -hmm. because he's heading up this uh, regiment. So um, well, another way of thinking about it is, I mean, imagine that m monument or memorial without the soldiers in it. It'd just mm -hmm. be another equestrian. Yeah. No. Yeah, it could be Paul oh, Revere, who knows? How yeah. should we be documenting and curating the manipulation and marking of public monuments that are artifacts of social protest? That's from our chat. Well, you do know that the Smithsonian, I believe the National Museum of African American History and Culture has been collecting some of the materials, particularly related to the Black Lives Matters protest. So I know this because I live in DC and I know some of the curators. So they have been actively going to sites and collecting this ephemeral material so that we have a legacy of thinking about 
both Black Lives Matter um, in public space, the art produced around it, but also in relationship to these interventions around monuments. And I think that's important. So museums are doing this. Um, I've seen some photo documentation online, um, but I think m museums, local museums here, I don't know how you all are doing it there, but are trying to, to deal with the incredible amount of art signage, t-shirts, et cetera, that are part of this movement, right? That we're seeing mm -hmm. in response. Mm -hmm. Lisa calls us to, uh, points this out. She says, we have an interesting example here in Massachusetts. Think of the Sargent House Museum. It opened around 1916 during the height of the all white colonial revival movement. It contains the busts of slave owners, including the first governor of the Mississippi territories, the busts and portraits in this educational space memorialize several generations of slave owners right up through the Civil War, but they're couched as gentlemen planters, gentlemen planters, she says, without irony, uh, patriots and leaders. Mm -hmm. hmm. This is the John Singer Sargent Museum? Or is, yes, is the Sargent House Museum. Sargent House Museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, take that up with the Board of Trustees at the Sargent Museum. They, uh, they, may, they better be thinking about it. <laughs> and, uh, Karen, I, I, they, that's a, I actually agree. They should take it up with both the director and with the board. Um, I, can I turn to a Q&A? Because uh, uh, Edmund uh, Barry Gaither has asked an interesting question about the 54th in relationship to Fuller's uh, Spirit of Emancipation and the step on board and on Cunning, uh, by Fern Cunningham, uh, which is a really important monument to Harriet Tubman. Um, mm -hmm. And they all do center around these issues of black engagement with self-emancipation, particularly the Harriet Tubman. The Fuller Monument's complicated. I mean, I talk about this in my book about her. I mean, it is two semi-nude figures and I'm glad it's in public space, but it is a it has its own complications and the references that she makes uh, to kind of type uh, in that. And what I mean, she's looking at photographs of African types and transfers them to the memorial. Um, and she talks about this, I don't, uh, 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 about looking at these photographs, particularly of a Senegalese. Um, but I do think that we can see about the 54th should of course be seen in dialogue with the monumental landscape of Boston, right? Mm -hmm. And that includes monuments created by African-American artists in the contemporary moment, should be part of that dialogue. Um, and interaction that happens, whether it's an educational program or the way that you might convey it uh, to, let's say, elementary and high school students. Mm -hmm. Barry Gaither follows up, relevant to the current discussion, who could address, who would address the public process attending the Martin Luther King Boston Memorial? Is it not a good case study? I'm not aware of, there's gonna be a King Monument on Boston. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's uh, it's called the embrace, and it's the hands of oh, 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 uh, 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 Dr. King and Coretta. So uh -huh. their face is not their face; it's not their person, uh -huh. but it's called the embrace, and it's a gold metallic looking statue. But I think uh, the there was a lot of um, community input uh, mm. into the process, which is gets back to what you were saying uh, earlier, Renee and David, in terms of how do you put a statue or a memorial uh, uh, or a monument? What's the process? Has there been discussion of why King and why not the rest of the movement? That's yeah. often a problem. Well, days. you know, Dr. King went to Boston University. Right. Coretta right. went to uh, right. New England Conservatory. Sure. Um, so I think, what know, is I think we own him. We own him here. That's right. <laughs> And it is a case study to think about. I, I would actually agree with Gaither. Like, can it be a good case study? Yes. I mean, there's there's case studies that fail. I think in Boston, you guys are trying to have a very, very difficult conversation about what that monument looks like, mm -hmm. how it's situated on Boston Common, um, what is its scale in relationship to other this historic space. I mean, I think that there seems to be from an outsider that you are having that conversation about how the monument um, will be located in that space, in that historic space. Mm. Leslie says that Fern Cunningham just passed away this week. Oh no! He was an amazing force here in Boston oh. and should be honored. I'm so sorry, Dave. I'm a huge fan of her work, so I'm very sad to hear that and have written about her extensively. So I'm, I, I just thank you for letting us know. That's sad, actually. We're, we're, we're almost out of time, um, but I'm going to ask uh, Renee and David, um, can you tell us one thing or two, three quick things that 
people don't know about the Shaw 54th Monument that they should know? Go ahead, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> I I'll think that was a putt, David. Um, <laughs> well, some, I, some interesting you know tidbit. Okay, so I think uh, one tidbit is its relationship to actually other to art history and to other art to other monuments. So that it's not some monument that's just out there in a void. It is uh, clearly related to the triumph of Titus, to these arches that we might see in Rome, right? To Roman art. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, um, there has been some analogies to the Arc de Triomphe uh, in Paris um, with um, Francis Rude's departure. So that it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting monument in that it dialogues with the past. And I think that's something we haven't talked a lot about. It's not, yes, it's an innovative form, but St. Gaudens working from Europe is looking at a lot of European examples to come up with this. Mm -hmm. David? Well, I'll, I'll mention just a couple of historical tidbits. For one thing, the two primary speakers at the unveiling in 1897 were Booker T. Washington and William James, the great Harvard philosopher. Mm -hmm. Their speeches are very much worth reading. Mm -hmm. I, I would say especially James's, but also, here's a little known fact. Augustus St. Gaudens attended the unveiling, but he mm -hmm. wanted no public role. He was the artist who just said, no, 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 I'm not speaking, I'm not, you know, artists don't usually like to get up and speak mm -hmm. about their art. He stood across the street. Mm -hmm. He tried mm -hmm. to be incognito. Mm -hmm. Wore a hat and all that. He just wanted to be there. Imagine being the artist. You don't, you'd only worked 15 years on this thing. Yeah. And, and there's this huge event, you know, unveiling this statue. Did he want to see the reaction of the people around him as opposed to him being no on stage? Doubt. No doubt, yeah. but he went back and he wrote an amazing passage about that mm -hmm. experience. I won't read it all, but he was especially moved. He said when the 65 veterans of the 54th marched in front of it, turned around and faced mm -hmm. the monument. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would suggest to people, imagine that. Those men, those 65 veterans, we're looking at faces in that monument and wondering, oh my God, mm -hmm. is that me? <laughs> yeah. There's no other monument where anyone can really do that. And St. Gaudens just stood at the rear and in the end he said, the unveiling uh, to him was a quote, consecration, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful word. For That's what beautiful. It represents. Now was Harriet Tubman, tell me about the Harriet Tubman thing. Was Harriet Tubman there at the unveiling of the monument or was she there when the 54th marched up Beacon Street? I keep hearing this oh, connection no. between. Everybody no. likes so, to put Harriet Tubman everywhere, but she can't right. everywhere. <laughs> okay. but she was a scout in, in South Carolina during the war. So no, she wasn't yeah. with the 54th. I mean, I think she attended to black soldiers, certainly as a nurse uh, during the war when she was in South Carolina. She was on a boat on the Kumbahi River. That's exactly right. <laughs> Okay. And you know, Harriet Tubman, I could actually, I'm just going to put this out there. We don't need any more monuments. We have something like 20 monuments of Harriet Tubman. There are other really remarkable black women and brown Good women point. who need to be memorialized. And I just throw that out there. Harriet okay. Tubman has become the easy monument. Yes. Um, and I think we need to make that a little more complex. All right. And uh, someone so in chat. Douglas. So is Douglas. So, yes. They're, yeah. they're bordering on 20 public monuments of Douglas. And here's a quick Harriet Tubman fact for you. When Frederick Douglass's son, Lewis, mm -hmm. arrived in Beaufort with the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, he writes a letter to his father and says, Father, we saw Harriet Tubman today. Mm -hmm. She was already Harriet Tubman. <laughs> yeah, already a legend. Uh, someone has noted in the chat that uh, uh, it might be not Fern Cunningham, but Fern Allen. So we'll just take oh, that off the line and check on <laughs> that. Sure. So, you know, I wish we had more time. Um, this has just been a fascinating discussion, but we, we, it's time for us to wrap things up. And we cannot thank you enough, Renee Ader and David Blight for leading us through this amazing conversation. And we wanna thank you, the audience, for participating in tonight's community conversation. The comments and questions that you shared will help the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th to shape future programs. Um, we've only just begun to scratch the surface on the framing of these community conversations in a time of racial reckoning. Stay tuned for more details as the community conversations continue with 
Voting Rights and the Perilous March to, Pre uh, to Freedom. Now, for more information about Renee and David, details about upcoming programs, updates on the status of the restoration project, and target date of the memorial's return to Beacon Hill, please visit Shaw54thMemorialRestoration.org. That's Shaw54thMemorialRestoration.org. And the web address is listed in the chat and posted on the Friends of the Public Gardens Facebook page. You'll also find a wonderful array of archival television, radio, and print media coverage as well as historical information related to the memorial. And one final note, everyone in the Shaw 54th Zoom room has been entered in a drawing for a swag bag with goodies from the partners to renew the Shaw 54th. And the uh, winners will be notified very soon. So we'd like everyone to have a great evening. Thank you for being here with us. Please be well and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.